Messianic Rabbi Russ Resnick, in his essay explaining the definition of Messianic Judaism offered by the UMJC, describes how Hebrew roots and one-law theology is incompatible with Messianic Judaism. He says, it is not the mission of Messianic Judaism to call Gentiles to Torah and Jewish roots. Indeed, promotion of Jewish roots, depending on what it means by the phrase, could diminish the unique place of Israel in God's plan. Torah remains a living and relevant document for all believers, Jewish and Gentile, but many of its specifics are intended for Israel alone. Messianic Jews are to draw upon the rich tradition of Torah, not necessarily because this tradition is mandated for all believers, but because we are Jews. Gentiles may be moved to participate in this tradition out of love for Israel and the God of Israel, but they must be careful to affirm the unique relationship of Israel to Torah. So Messianic Judaism teaches that the New Testament instructs that Jewish followers of Jesus maintain a responsibility to express their faith in the Lord and their gratitude of his salvation by observing things like circumcision, Shabbat, the feast, kosher law, etc., and that non-Jewish followers of Yeshua do not have this responsibility. We find this teaching in the Jerusalem Council decision of Acts 15, Paul's rule in all the congregations in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20, and in Paul's circumcising the Jewish Timothy in Acts 16, 3, but not circumcising the Greek Titus in Galatians 2, 3. And all of these passages teach against one law theology. I'll talk more about 1 Corinthians 7 later, but I'd like to explore Acts 15, at least for a little minute, because this is a passage that Hebrews adherents love to try to use to support their position. In Acts 15, James, Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, and other leaders are discussing a position raised by Pharisaic followers of Yeshua who claimed, it is necessary to circumcise them, that is non-Jewish followers of Yeshua, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Ultimately, James decides that no, non-Jews do not have to become Jews and observant of the whole law of Moses to be saved and members of the believing community. However, they are meant to abstain from things like sexual immorality, blood, food strangled, and meat sacrificed to idols. Then he completes the meeting with a final line, verse 21, which says, For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Hebrew Roots teachers like 119 Ministries latch onto this verse and claim, see the four prohibitions we're giving as a starting point for non-Jewish Torah observance, but James is saying they will be learning the rest of the Torah since they are in the synagogues hearing it. They will slowly become more and more Torah observant until they are fully Torah observant. So there are many problems with the Hebrew Roots interpretation here, but I'd just like to go over a few of them. First, even on their own view, there is a clear limitation to their logic. Non-Jews were certainly not permitted to undergo ritual circumcision. So the possibility that non-Jews were expected to eventually become observant of the whole Torah cannot be the case, especially in view of Galatians 5.3, where Paul says only those circumcised, in other words, Jews, are obligated to follow the whole law. He says, again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to keep the whole Torah. If verse 21 was an instruction for Gentiles to attend synagogue and observe more and more Torah, then it would have been included in the actual letter that was sent out to the congregations. And this is a really key point. Acts 15, 20 through 21 presents the articulation of the decision during the council meeting itself with the leadership. However, later in Acts 15, Luke records what the letter that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas took out to the Gentiles actually said. And so I won't read it here in full, but as you, as you see, this is the letter that goes out to the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, but nowhere in here is, this, is verse 21 repeated about uh, hearing Moses in the synagogue on Shabbat. And certainly nothing about taking on more and more Torah. And this, if this was so crucial, why was it not included in the actual letter? In fact, the actual letter explicitly states that they will lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And so in addition to those problems, verse 21 is also vague. It doesn't actually say that non-Jews were expected to go to synagogue on Shabbat to take on more and more Torah. The Hebrew roots teachings are very speculative 
Even scholars widely disagree on the meaning of this verse, so it's a very tenuous verse to rely on, uh, but they do so heavily nonetheless. And in fact, despite its, its vagueness, there are even more plausible interpretations than the one offered by the Hebrew Roots camp. I think James could simply be appealing to the fact that his decision that non-Jews are not obligated to be circumcised and take on the entire law of Moses is just a basic fact of Torah, which is reinforced every week when the Torah is read. If James required non-Jews to observe the whole Torah, he would be contradicting the Torah itself. Verse 21 could be James's way of saying, look, I'm not saying anything new here. This is what the Torah has always taught and will always teach. So Acts 15 does not support Hebrew roots theology. It contradicts it. Hebrew roots and one law adherents think all aspects of the Torah are commanded to all non-Jews, whereas Messianic Gentiles understand they are personally being led to observe many of these things, but not out of a sense of covenantal responsibility like the people of Israel. And they understand that just because they are led, it does not mean everyone else is too. Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. David Rudolph points out an important distinction in how Hebrew roots people understand their relationship to Torah practices like Shabbat, the festivals, and kosher, and how Messianic Gentiles understand their relationship. He writes, in my conversations with people who are drawn to the Hebrew roots one law movement, I often point out that there's a difference between personal calling and universal ideal. Some Gentile believers are led by the Holy Spirit to come alongside Jewish people and participate in the rhythm of Jewish life. If someone has a personal calling along these lines, they should not assume that everyone else in the world has this calling as well. In fact, the vast majority of Gentile believers in churches do not have this calling, as evidenced by their not having any sense of divine leading to observe the festivals, etc. By distinguishing between personal calling and universal ideal, we are able to affirm the Gentile believers who says, I sense that the Holy Spirit is leading me to celebrate the festivals, while at the same time being clear that the Hebrew Roots One Law view departs from New Testament teaching when it asserts that Jewish life is God's universal ideal for the nations. So why is this the case? Why aren't all the nations called to observe all of the Torah? One of the reasons, I think, derives from the purpose of the Torah itself, or one of the primary purposes of the Torah itself. One of the primary pur purposes of the Torah is to make Israel distinct from the nations in order that God may be glorified by what he does through the small and weak nation. So imagine if every nation in the world began keeping kosher, Shabbat, circumcision, the feasts, and, and all the rest, then Israel will no longer be distinct. One law theology is a reverse replacement theology. Rather than Israel being lost by being replaced, Israel is lost by being replicated.